ladies and gentlemen. You are tuned in to another great episode of Excuse Me, I'm Speaking. If this is your first time clicking on this podcast, thank you so much. I promise you won't regret it. If you're a returning listener, thank you for your support. Y'all, before I forget to introduce myself, this podcast is hosted by yours truly, the one and only... She, she is me, she is Twinkle, I'm talking about myself, y'all can call me Twinkle, call me Antoinette, as long as you're calling my name, that's really all that matters to me. Yeah, so let's just go ahead and get started with today's show. So I start off every show with a temperature check, so a quick mood check. Yeah, my mood today is, and I don't even know if this is like a mood, but I'm feeling really productive. Like, I guess I'm like proud. So I got like some book writing done and um, some research, some work on my podcast, and I am just like feeling like energized. So I hope that as it like gets towards the end of the week here, you guys are feeling the same, you're feeling productive, and you are ready for the weekend. All right. Yeah. So of course, I start off every podcast as well with a question of the day and today's question of the day is a little different it is a fill in the blank so the question of the day is the thought of blank brings an instant smile to my face I'm gonna say it one more time the thought of blank brings an instant smile to my face Yeah, this question um, is very easy for me. It actually came about just a few days ago. I was in my kitchen and um, I was actually thinking of my grandparents and they are no longer with us, like one of my set of grandparents. But I have my grandma's cookie jar, which was like a like a family, like heirloom relic, whatever you want to call it. And it was literally there since I was a kid. And so now that I have it in my home, I keep a picture of myself and my grandparents right next to it, a picture I have with both of them. And just thinking of them, looking at their picture, if I think of either one of them, but definitely seeing the smiles on their face in the picture, it brings an instant smile to my face. Like no matter my mood, I can be angry, I can be upset, I can be sad. I could be feeling nothing. If I want to instantly smile, all I have to do is think of them. And it just really warms my heart. And it lets me know that I got through the grieving process that I needed to. And like now when I think of them, I don't think of sadness, but like it brings an instant smile to my face. So yeah, I would love to hear your answers as well. The question is the thought of what brings an instant smile to your face? Please send me your responses. Um, send them to me via Instagram. Of course, y'all can follow me at she is Twinkle one like my husband said, because it's only one of me. And um, y'all can send it in my DM comment. I would love to hear what brings an instant smile to your face. Now, y'all know that I have to get into the updates and dun dun dun. Y'all are probably like, oh my gosh, you better not talk about Love is Blind. But I have to, y'all. So really quick, Love is Blind has been all over the media. So I have to say there are really quick three updates. First update from Love is Blind, they, as in the general public, they are hot. They are upset. They are mad about the hosting that Nick Lachey and Vanessa Lachey did for the Love is Blind season four reunion. Yeah, I can't even lie. I agree with the general public. They did freaking horrible. <laughs> like, horrible. Like, if y'all have a chance, y'all should go watch it yourself. Vanessa Lachey was very biased. She, it looked like she had a formed, like, outside friendships with some of the women on the show. So she was not giving the women a hard time at all. Some of the girls that were, like, horrible mean girls or Jackie that was just horrible, like, talked about her fiancé just horribly and talked about other people on the show who didn't even show up to the reunion. She just let them pass. She gave like the nicest guys on the show, like such a hard time. She threw her opinion in there. And personally, from my perspective, she looked very intoxicated. Now that has not been confirmed, but just from my point of view, she looked 
like she was drunk. Okay, so that would ex- that would explain some of her behavior as well. Now I don't know if she's actually going to get fired, but hey, if y'all do replace her, I'm I'm all here for it. A lot of people have been putting names out there of different people that could do better at hosting. I personally think Jessie Wu, which she's a singer as well as a comedian, she reviews all the Love Is Blind shows. She does it on YouTube. She does amazing. Like it's hilarious. All of her reviews are anywhere from like an hour to an hour and a half and they are laugh out loud funny. I would definitely take her. She would hold everybody accountable or hey, the power couple from season one, Lauren and Cameron, they are a living, breathing witness that the experiment works. So why not have them take over and become the host of the show and the reunion? But that's just my two cents. Speaking of number two, let's move on to the second update, which would be that there are there's a couple from season two of Love is Blind that they are filing a lawsuit. Now, they are not no, they are no longer a couple. They are now divorced, but they are supposedly filing a lawsuit against the producers of Love is Blind for apparently like neglectful work conditions. They said they weren't like fed enough. They didn't get enough water they the woman specifically she was not mentally stable enough to do it and um she had like self-harming thoughts and things of that nature and apparently the producers made her feel like she couldn't just quit and leave and go home um they were scared that they would get fined for leaving the show early according to their contracts um however It ultimately was like horrible for their marriage and they reached out to producers after the fact for like assistance um, because of the emotional and mental challenges they were having in their marriage and now they are divorced and they're fighting back with the lawsuit. Now, quickly, my two cents. They signed contracts, obviously. Now, this Love is Blind is no different from any other reality TV show. There's a million reality stars that will tell you, like, once you sign up for this, there's a spotlight on you. Like, it's not easy. Like, it is hard. It is hard taking public opinion and ridicule and then just having cameras in your face all day long, which is why they have you sign contracts. So personally, I don't know how far this lawsuit is going to be able to go, because if that's the case, then every reality star from every network is going to start suing their producers. I don't know that this is actually going to stick because of the fine print. However, I do feel like this is also a social experiment and a game. So if you did want the experiment to stop, you felt like you couldn't go through with it, then you just simply don't accept the proposal. Like you just don't, then you don't move on. Then you're not paying a fine. Nothing is working against you. You're just done. That's just common sense to me, but hey, maybe I'm wrong. I do know they get paid every week that they're on there, so I think there's some give and take from both sides. It's not like it's like a large amount of money, but when you continue to go through with it and like you don't seek your own legal counsel and like like mental professionals, mental health professionals, I do think that there's things that can be argued on both sides. So we shall see how this turns out. If this lawsuit is successful, this could potentially be a turning point for a lot of different networks and a lot of different reality stars throughout the years. So I will keep you guys updated on that. Third of all, um, from that same season, there is now reports out there. Um, We know Ayana and Jared, they are... Divorced. They got divorced close to a year after they got married in the first season. So, like, nobody from the first season is together. I mean, the second season is together anymore. But Jared and Ayana, they've been broken up. They've been pleasant publicly. We didn't know why. We could just speculate. But apparently, Ayana has been watching the past few seasons and it's kind of been triggering to her. And so, she went on a podcast recently and she just had to let it all out. She couldn't hold it in to protect his image anymore. Apparently, they got a divorce because he cheated on her. She received an email um, a few days before filming their update episode, and it was very graphic and detailed, and there were pictures, and I'm like, ooh, Jesus. 
Wow, that's a lot. But y'all, so she is putting out her truth out there and Jared has responded back on his Instagram like, oh, you ain't about to start talking. Okay, well, wait till I'm about to come out with my story. Yeah, I don't know what the cheater can come out and say, but I will keep y'all updated. All right. (laughs) Okay. Now, enough of my updates. Let's get into the real reason why we are here. I am here to discuss... Michelle Obama and Oprah Winfrey's like most recent interview together, which is also um, presented in documentary form. It is on Netflix, y'all. It is called The Light We Carry, um, Michelle Obama and Oprah Winfrey. Y'all, when I tell y'all this was so good, it was an hour and a half long. If you have not watched it, you definitely should. I got so much out of it. Have y'all ever like clicked on something and you're like, eh, I don't, know. I don't even know like if this is going to be worth it, but let me give it a try. Y'all, that was me. That's what I did. I watched the preview and was like, okay, you know, her hair is cute. She got the braids popping. Okay, we don't ever see former first lady Michelle Obama with the braids. Come on, black girl magic. Yeah, so I clicked on it. Her little cream pantsuit was cute. Oprah Winfrey hair was cute. I'm like, she got her bundles in. Yeah, but beyond the aesthetic look of it, their words like really captivated me. It was a moment of like, dang, I didn't even know that I needed this until I watched it. So yeah, I'm just going to give y'all like a few tidbits from it that really stood out to me that I thought would be great to share with the podcast. Yeah, so as I stated... Um, this was, um, called the light we carry the light we carry was the name of her book tour, but also the name of her book, Michelle Obama's book. It was, it's her second book after her first book becoming. And so this special was recorded in Los Angeles in December of 2022. So it wasn't too long ago. And her and Oprah had a sit down in front of like a large arena full of a ton of people. Um, Sasha and Malia were there to support their mother, Uh, Michelle Obama and like they were just having a chat like they were just like good old like Judy's like they were like the best of friends which you can tell that they actually do have a real friendship that they've built so um, Michelle Obama was just um, basically talking about like where her books stem from which shockingly enough um, it stemmed right after she finished her last book tour which she finished at the beginning of 2020 the becoming book tour then next thing you know the whole world shuts down and what happens is the start of the pandemic and so of course they're not in the White House anymore they were no longer in that position as president and first lady but because Barack Obama is like very knowledgeable about these types of things um, because he is the one that kept control of the Ebola virus before it spiraled out of control she felt like reasonably like safe and comfortable because her husband was so knowledgeable but they still were like isolated um she was still seeing like the news reports and there was like a lot of people out there with misinformation um she couldn't go around like large settings of people and she's more of like an extrovert she's used to being around people and communicating and traveling all over the world and so that was starting to weigh on her mentally as well like seeing the number of deaths in the world seeing people out there just not caring about COVID and yet knowing that they're just going to go back home and spread it to their loved ones, like those types of things were really getting to her. So she said, there's people that have been around her throughout the years that have asked her questions like, hey, how do you overcome your fear? How do you find your voice? Like, how do you feel seen? Those were the same questions she found herself asking like herself, like, how am I going to overcome in this moment of uncertainty during the pandemic? Because during the pandemic, she admitted herself that she was spiraling downward into a depression. Like many of us probably experienced like during that time or at any other time in our life. And she said she felt like she was losing her light in the midst of all of these heightened levels of fear and anxiety in the world and and, and just in her life. She couldn't find the light anymore inside of her. So that's what sparked this book was because she felt like she needed to dig into her toolbox to help herself first and then be able to produce this content to help others. So one of the things, oddly enough, that she said she picked up on during that time period in her life was knitting. 
which like the audience laughed. But oddly enough, I instantly understood her because no, I'm not a grandma and I don't sit around like knitting and, you know, preparing for podcast episodes, but I do know how to knit. I learned in the sixth grade. And so um, I related to her when she said that knitting was meditative for her because it was something that she did to calm and quiet her mind. So that was one of the things in her toolbox that she shared that she did that she um, suggested to others, find that thing that you do that can quiet your mind. A lot of us, especially when you have anxiety, when you have fears, um, if you've dealt with depression, if even if you have just a lot going on in your life or your family, or you have like a uncertainty and you're questioning things, like how do you quiet your mind when it's like going 90 miles per hour? Will you figure out what task helps you do that without even trying hard? So hers was knitting. I know for for some people, it could be listening to music. Me personally, I'll listen to a song with a lot of words, like like a rap song that has like a million words where like I'm trying to recite every word to the song because now I'm thinking of the song and like life that's completely different from mine. So now I could quiet my mind because I'm thinking of something else. For other people, it's reading. For other people, it's walking outside in nature and you're listening to um, like the birds and the cars passing by and the wind and the trees. Find that thing that quiets your mind. Um, she said laughter was a tool of hers as well. Laughing like with friends or um, for some of us, we can watch a comedy show and like, you know, you don't go in there intending to laugh, but you're like, oh, that was funny. You know, it makes you stop thinking about um, everything else that's going on in your mind. But her number one thing was focus on what you can control. So with the knitting, she can control that even laughing, getting her mind off of things, focus on what you can control. There were different segments of her book that she um, dedicated to certain people in her life because they taught her lessons on the light that she carries. So of course she had a chapter in there devoted to her parents, but more specifically, her father really played a part in the underlining meaning and theme of this book. She said her dad taught her that nobody can make you feel bad about yourself if you feel good about yourself. And like the first time she said it, it didn't register for me. And I watched it back a second time and I'm like, gosh, it's so simple, but it makes so much sense. Like nobody can make you feel bad about yourself if you feel good about yourself. So like, forget what other people say, like focus on you. Like, what do you think about you? Because that's what matters at the end of the day. Her dad taught her that we can't control what other people think, what they say, or what they do. Yes, that's common sense. But, like, we get triggered by it. We get upset about it. We allow it to affect our entire mood and our day. We allow it to, like, dim the light within us, and we start questioning ourselves. But once again, if you feel good about yourself, nobody else can make you feel bad about yourself because you can't control them. But you do have control over how you feel about yourself. She did say that... The number one thing from her dad that she's carried with her throughout the years since he's passed away is that he told her that our light can't be dependent on someone else because they may not have it to give. So like earlier in the show, um, I said the thought of my grandparents is what instantly brings a smile to my face. So bringing that back to the current topic The light that my grandparents had, the light that they like brought into the room when they walked into the room, the happiness that they bring to my face. Like I can't necessarily, I couldn't be dependent upon that because they weren't going to always have it to give. Like they weren't going to always be around and I still have to be okay. Even if they're not around, they're not here. I can't depend on how somebody else feels about me or those people that do make me feel good. Like I have to feel good about me. I fuel that light within me. Yeah, it was really good. That's why I'm getting excited. (laughs) But she digs deeper. She says, it's your job to make yourself feel good. That's your responsibility. She was reminded by her dad that we have control over our life and our feelings. So in the midst of a world when it feels like everything is out of control, you have to remind yourself you do have control. 
You just need to learn how to manage your emotions and manage your feelings. And there's a few different ways that um, she did that. Um, she said specifically, like what really got to her, what really made her hone in on the fact that she has control over her life, even though life appears to be unfair at times, was watching her dad struggle. So her dad, you know, he was like a big guy as far as like a tall guy. He struggled with MS. And so that is a medical condition and, you know, sickness. And so, but even in the midst of that, her watching him go through that, at times it was hard for her as a daughter because she looks at her dad as like this like light and this like strong tower in her life. But at times because of him, his MS, she would see him like slip and fall on the floor at home. And, you know, a big guy that your dad that's tumbling over, like, you know, everybody like freaks out, like, is he okay? But he would literally laugh it off and get up and he would keep going. Like he had hard days struggling with his sickness, but like, He could have gone into a depression. He could have been negative. He could have blamed everybody around him for his circumstances or took it out on them because he was physically in pain, but he never did that. She basically described him as the guy that looks at the glass half full. He looked at life with rose colored glasses like he was just happy and he was grateful. And maybe in that, that was a lesson that he was like trying to indirectly teach his children. And that is definitely a lesson that she learned from. And it's helped her even in her 50s at this point in life. So she said she specifically learned from him. You fall, you get up and you keep moving. I thought that was really special because I know that I have a cousin who she had struggled with like a disease as similar to MS. Not going to tell her story because it's not my story to tell. But from my perspective, looking at her battle with that, to me, like she wasn't battling through it. She was like championing her way through it. And she could have every reason in the world to be mad and to be upset and to frown and take it out on people. But like she was just always like so happy and smiling and laughing and maybe that was the tools in her toolbox she was using and we didn't even realize it we her family around her I know that in the midst of even her having like days of pain and struggling you would literally see her cheering and happy for everybody else and like that was a light that was about her that just shined like when she came into the room like you was happy that she was there because she also went along with The whole idea of you fall, you get up, but you keep moving. Yeah, I'm going to keep going because I could like preach a whole sermon on this, okay? Next, she talked about Barack Obama. A sentence that was in the documentary that really stood out to me is that she said in her book, I've lived many places and Barack is my home. And I was like, wow, wow. And I've heard like a lot of different people refer to that. Like, what is home to you? Like, like your home is supposed to be like your safe place, like your place to like land, like your place where like, no matter where I'm at, like I feel safe and secure. Like when I'm with you, like I've lived a lot of places, but like when I'm with you, like that feels right. That feels secure. Like I'm at home. So I thought that was really sweet. They showed a lot of different pictures of them together. Interesting enough, she said they've been married for 30 years and people are so shocked when she's like, yeah, you know, it's been a great marriage. But for 10 of those years, like I couldn't stand him. And like people are like, what? Like, but she was like, no, it's just the truth of the matter. And it's a process even in a, in a relationship and learning each other. And she said, you know, if 10 out of the 30 years is that wasn't good, like she'll take her chances with that. Like those odds are good because the 20 outweighs the 10. Like they've had a lot of blessings to come out of it. Um, she's learned a lot of life lessons, even just personally. She's had to mature within herself. He's had to mature, but they've respected each other enough to like grow and understand that they communicate differently. She specifically said that something she wanted to teach her daughters was that it's okay to just be yourself. And maybe it's the church girl in me. 
I automatically thought of, you know, that, oh, him, this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Yeah, I was like, oh man, like if you really think of the words to the song, it's everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. It just all connects and relates. And I thought that, you know, that was just my little side note on that. But anyways, she said that a pivotal turning point in her life and her marriage with her and Barack Obama is that they realized that they couldn't be everything for each other. So more specifically, they realized that they needed to rely on their kitchen table. So what she refers to the kitchen table as is literally like in your house, you have a kitchen table. And so I guess with her growing up, the kitchen table was her safe place, her place where she could go and she could vent and she could air out all of her frustrations, all of her worries. And her family was around the kitchen table and the people around this kitchen table are supposed to be the people that you can trust. You can be raw and authentic and true with and let out all of your emotions and then take a breath, get up move on and now you have a clear mind and you can move forward in life okay because you got it all out in this safe space and it's not going anywhere beyond this kitchen table so she said her kitchen table of friends is what helped to take the pressure off of her marriage but more importantly she said everybody didn't make it to the kitchen table let me repeat that Everybody didn't make it. She said it's kind of, you can refer to it as like a mountain with a slow climb up to the kitchen table. She said some of those people were literally lost oxygen and they couldn't make the climb. And so I related that to like, if you have those people that are like poisonous to you and they're literally like sucking the life out of you and you feel like you're losing oxygen, they probably shouldn't make the climb to your kitchen table. So then Oprah asked her, okay, so for those friends of yours that didn't make the climb, they ran out of oxygen, they couldn't make it to your kitchen table. Did you have a conversation with them? Did you tell them? How did you break off those friendships? And she laughed because, of course, this is televised. So now those friends are going to find out. But basically, she said, well, you know, I slow ghosted them. And everybody in the audience started to laugh because we all kind of had an idea of what that was. Because if we're honest, all of us have slow ghosted somebody at one point or another in our lives. So she said, a slow ghost is basically like when you don't cut them off right away, but you just become a little less available that's how she kind of eliminated some of those people from making it to her kitchen table. So I definitely appreciated that segment of the program because we just recently talked about friends on this podcast. And I think all of us probably need to examine like who is sitting at our kitchen table. So the other portion uh, that really stood out to me in this interview special was Oprah asked her, okay, so now that you've written the book, do you still struggle with your light dimming or fear and anxiety? She said, definitely. She still struggles with like self-consciousness and fear from time to time. But what she's learned in this entire process and just throughout life, making it to her 50s, She said, you have to work to fuel your light and don't allow others to dim it. So pouring into yourself, she said, the most important thing is to practice being kind to yourself, affirming yourself, kind of like those affirmations. That's practicing being kind to yourself. So that leads into one of the last portions of the entire segment, which was her famous quote, when they go low, we go high. And it's synonymous with Michelle Obama's name. Of course, she said that during one of the presidential election campaigns, when it was a point in time where she could have stooped down to the opposing party's levels, but she didn't. She said, when they go low, we go high. Now, Oprah was being very honest with her, just like the rest of us was kind of looking at her like, okay, girl, that sounds great, but do you always go high? Because sometimes taking the high road is like not satisfying. Sometimes taking the high road is like very hard. They went low, so I want to go lower. So she explained it a little bit. She said that 
Going high usually involves the process of taking a pause before you react to things. In her eyes, that's what it means to go high. You went low, and if I just react without thinking about it, I'm going to go as low as you or lower than that because my flesh is going to kick in. But if I take a pause before I react, then I can think the things out. And so she said in the midst of that pause, sometimes like that's when she goes to her kitchen table because at her kitchen table is when she can go low. Like she can get as low as possible. She can get everything out to those people, those trusted people at the kitchen table. And she can say exactly how she feels and go to the lowest of lows and get it all off her chest, off her consciousness. And then she can breathe. And then she can walk away from the table and then she can choose to react in a better way to the person in the situation. Then she can go high and that'll, it'll look like, oh man, they went low, but she went high. But like she had measures in place to be able to manage her emotions so that she didn't go low. So I definitely appreciated that. She said um, in her words specifically, going high doesn't mean that you don't feel the rage. It doesn't mean that you're not supposed to feel. Going high is the choice of your approach. Your feelings are valid. Even in the moment when you wanted to go low, but you didn't, you might have felt rage. You might have felt angry. You might have felt upset. You might have felt like, I'm about to say something smart Alec back. But you took a step back and you paused before you reacted. And all those feelings you're feeling are real. They're valid. You can't help the way that you feel. But you made a choice to change your approach and how you respond. That was going high. She specifically said, leaders with platforms have a responsibility to go high because your message is going out there to the masses. So I even think of it just even for me, just little old me on a podcast. I put myself out there. I feel like I have to be responsible with it. She did say, We go high, but we do the work. She said, you build your light and you protect it. You protect yourself from the poison. Then you share your light and you lead with your light. So yeah, I thought it was amazing. Just my personal, like what I got out of it. For those of y'all that don't know me personally, a lot of my family members don't even actually know my real name. If they saw Antoinette, they'd be like, who like why would you call her that so they think my name is twinkle and there was a point in life where I tried to get away from twinkle like hey I'm getting older like can you please call me Antoinette they're like no your name is twinkle we only know you as twinkle and so I decided let me embrace it because twinkle is a part of me but I am Antoinette as well so that's why I came up with she is twinkle Because there's something about me that sparkles and shines. I know a light that I carry. So that's why her her special really stood out to me like so much because I think that all of us have to remember that we have this light inside of us. I always say nobody can be you better than you. Like that's what makes you unique is that you are you. Your light is not dependent on anybody else. Your light cannot be dimmed by anybody else unless you allow it to. So things that were around me, whether it's people, whether it was places of employment, whether it was places of leisure, if it doesn't help to fuel my fire, then it's not good for me. Everybody is responsible for protecting their light. A lot of people like say the words within the past few years, protect your peace, protect your peace. And that peace is the light that's inside of you. Protect your heart. Your heart is connected to that light that's inside of you. Yeah, I could go on a tangent. I could think of a million different ways to (laughs) portray this message to you guys. But I will not preach you a sermon and bore you to death. But yeah, it was so good. If you have not gotten a chance to watch it, you should definitely watch it. But anywho, y'all. Wrapping up the show, let's just speed on into some quick celebrity news. So the 2023 NFL Draft, it is taking place here 
right now. It is the 27th, April 27th through the 29th. So it will be happening all weekend down at the Union Station. The NFL Draft will be here. So we're going to have all kinds of celebrities and future celebrities in town. So that is great news for Kansas City. The articles that are out there um, with information about it are suggesting that they expect at least 300,000 people. So... That parking is going to be very interesting. (laughs) I know there's a lot of like free public transportation down that way as well, too. Uber drivers are probably going to be making crazy money. So, yes, that is the latest in celebrity news moving right along. So, I had app suggestions the number one app i downloaded it this week it is called i am and it's an affirmations app so kind of like i was talking about in today's segment um when i was talking about like affirming yourself and being kind to yourself and well practicing being kind to yourself you can do that by doing affirmations and you don't necessarily have to write your own there's an app out there it is called i am i have it on my phone right now as well and it's free You do not have to pay for like the premium version. I never pay. Maybe I'm just cheap, but whatever. Yeah, moving on to the very last app suggestion. It is an app called Supercook. Supercook is a really great app because it literally asks you a questionnaire like what do you currently have in your pantry? All the way down to like spices, seasonings, fruits, vegetables, like fresh. Um, Some of them that's like actually you are, you know, already in a seasoning bottle um they ask you like what type of dressings you have what type of sauces and you select everything you have even if like nothing makes sense like i have peanut butter but i don't have jelly it's okay you put everything in the app and then they present you with possible recipes for different like food items you can make according to the items that you have in your kitchen i've used the super cook app it is like really good so you should check that out But to end the show, although I did have a million quotes in here from Michelle Obama um, as well, um, guys, make sure you go check out her book and buy it. Her book is available anywhere where books are sold. But back to my quote of the day, um, which is also by Brene Brown. I've done a quote by her um, before, Um, but the quote is, staying vulnerable is a risk we have to take if we want to experience connection. Again, Staying vulnerable is a risk we have to take if we want to experience connection. I thought that was great. A great reminder. Yeah, this has been another episode of Excuse Me, I'm Speaking. Thank y'all so much for tuning in. Please send me your feedback, your questions, your comments, um, your answers to some of the questions. Hey, if you have any suggestions for things that you think I should watch as well that I haven't mentioned on here, Please let me know. As always, follow me on Instagram at sheistwinkle1. DM me. Leave a comment. I look forward to getting back on here next week to bring you guys a brand new episode. Love you all, and I am out. Peace.